Welcome, everybody. I'm registered dietitian Myrna Haig. This is a Myrna Method podcast. My goal is to bring you scientific back nutrition information. It will greatly impact your life. Things that you can use immediately. So it's one thing to bring a lot of studies to the table, but if you can't immediately make it part of your lifestyle and change your life, then what good is it, right? So tonight, we're going to talk about short chain fatty acids. And this will give you a little more insight why I chose gut bacteria is one of the primary root causes of obesity. Not getting that right in your diet is really critical. So tonight, we're going to talk about what are short chain fatty acids. By the way, they're not fats. They're, well, they're, they're chemically have some parts that are somewhat fats. They're very short chain fatty acids. So they don't act like regular fats in the body. And then why are these short chain fatty acids so critical for our health? And why the lack of these short chain fatty acids? Why not understanding? When you don't understand how to balance these short chain fatty acids, how to get them in the right quantities, and the right variety in your diet, through your gut, then you're going to have some implications with your health, especially obesity. So, yeah, I always talk about why are we overweight? Because, you know, I want to bring impactful information to you. But at the end of the day, my mission, big mission, big goal is to reverse obesity. Because when you reverse obesity, you reverse over 75% of diseases in this country. You reverse obesity and you pretty much fix your health. So question is, why are we overweight? Is because we are lazy, we lack willpower, we're just uneducated, we're just too busy, we don't exercise enough, million excuses, and I'm here to tell you, none of that's true. Because the root cause of obesity is biochemical feedback loops. It's actually what triggers the overeating. People don't just sit down and just senselessly eat. There's something that's driving them to eat. And what is that? These are these feedback loops. Call it food addiction. Call it a drive to want to have that second helping. But bottom line, what it all boils down to is not understanding how to eat to balance these areas. And so tonight, we're going to dive into the gut bacteria. So. What are we going to talk about? Well, first of all, with the gut bacteria and how it is responsible for so many health issues and also for keeping our body balanced so we don't want to eat excess food, gut bacteria made the cut in the Myrna method. So what is it with gut bacteria that's so important? Well, let me tell you what, if you don't get gut bacteria right, it's one of the four corners of balance I talk about in the Myrna Method, you are going to be following the obesity cycle. You know, where everybody thinks it's about behavior and addiction. Well, you just eat too much. Well, not really. There's something going on up here, and gut bacteria is one part of the puzzle. So let's dive into it. Where do we get all this gut bacteria? We get it from fiber foods, right? We're going to get it from plant foods. These plant foods are then digested in the intestinal tract. Now, the stomach helps digest our foods, but it's actually in the intestinal tract through a fermentation process that we create good bacteria and these short-chain fatty acids. So these are both little chem chemical compounds. That's kind of how you have to think of it. So these good bacteria's main goal is to be able to kill the bad bacteria. So here's this fermentation as soon as we bring in these fibers, gets into the intestinal tract, the intestinal tract begins to ferment them through bacteria. That's right, the more bacteria you get from foods, the more bacteria you have to break down the foods you're eating. So. If you're somebody that's not eating a lot of plant foods, maybe your diet is really void, you're not going to be getting the extra 
good bacteria that you normally would. And over time, you can actually get irritable bowel syndrome because you're lacking some of these good bacteria. Now, these good bacteria, the main job in the gut, this being the gut, their main job in the gut is to attack the bad bacteria. Now, these bad bacteria come from eating foods like meat, cheese, eggs, anything animal origin, a lot of oil, sugars, all those type of foods. The foods that aren't plant foods are going to be the other type of foods that are gonna create more of the bacteria that's not so good. These bacteria, if they get too out of control, will then populate in excessive amounts in the gut and they will travel to the bloodstream. And it's in the bloodstream that they go to other tissues and they can cause damage. So these bad bacteria, if they get outnumbered because we don't have enough of the good guys to kill them, because that's exactly what the good guys do, is they come in and they destroy these bad bacteria and they lessen the amount in the gut. Now we've talked before how eating a high fat diet can actually create a film that protects these bad bacteria. So when you have a high fat diet, some of that fat in the gut can help protect the bad bacteria and the good guys just can't get to them and kill them in the mass numbers it would like to. So these bad bacteria begin to flourish. And that's where we have a situation that they start to leave the gut and can cause other problems with other tissue. Now, the other thing the good bacteria does when it's in the fermentation process is it creates short chain fatty acids. And these are chemicals that travel in the bloodstream, but these are the good guys because they only do good things. That's what we're gonna talk about tonight. Some of the science behind how these short chain fatty acids can actually benefit our body. So let's take a deep dive. When we look at the short chain fatty acids, what we find out with these is that there's receptor sites that are on cells. You're going to see receptor sites on immune cells. You're going to see receptor sites on brain cells. So a lot of the cells in our body have these little receptor sites. Now, these receptor sites sit on top of the cells, and they're a perfect match for these short-chain fatty acids. These short-chain fatty acids attach themselves onto the receptor site and that's when some of the magic happens inside the cell, which is what we're going to talk about tonight, is some of the magic that happens in brain cells, immune cells, when these short-chain fatty acids that travel through the bloodstream because you're eating a lot of good fiber foods, getting strong fermentation, they begin to affect other cells in our body. These other cells actually have receptor sites. It's kind of like an invitation where they're waiting for these short chain fatty acids to hop aboard. Come on, hop aboard. Let's see you do something really good for me. It's kind of what it seems like is these receptor sites are there for that reason. So they actually affect cell signaling, just like the bad bacteria can get on cells and damage the cells. So we have some of the bad bacteria damaging the cells, and we have some of the short chain fatty acids made from the good bacteria trying to help out at the cellular level. Now we know the good bacteria helps out at the gut level, right? Because the good bacteria is gonna try to kill the bad guys. But when those bad guys get into circulation, they make it through the gut and they're traveling in the bloodstream, We've got some of the short chain fatty acids trying to help us out as well. That's also made from fermentation from the plant foods through the gut bacteria. So here's some of the things that happens. These bad gut bacteria can travel through the brainstem and can manipulate the appetite in the hypothalamus. So these bad bacteria can actually have a way of making us want the very foods we don't really want to eat. So these bad bacteria, it's almost like they want to stay alive. So they travel to the brain and they say, hey, eat more foods that create more of this type of bacteria so we 
can hang around. Because these bacteria are like their own little entities themselves. They're, they have their own little life and they want to stay around. So one of the ways they do it is they kick up the appetite in the brain. So it's funny because after about two to three weeks, when you start to change the gut and you start to change the bacteria in the gut. Now, remember, if you have IBS or you're not, you're not used to eating a lot of vegetables, maybe you just didn't grow up eating a lot of vegetables, you may have a tough time at first trying to eat all the plant foods that are really required for this healthy gut. You may have to build back slowly. And that's one of the things I talked about in other podcasts as well, is that you almost have to build back your gut to be able to eat all the wonderful fibers from plants without any intolerant problems because you slowly build up the good bacteria from eating those foods. So these good bacteria also help make adequate amounts of short chain fatty acids. So that's why a lot of studies talk about, hey, you know, eating a lot of vegetables, we see that there's definitely a decrease in cancers. And everybody thinks, oh, it's because of all the uh, vitamins and minerals and, and all these great foods and the polyphenols. Okay, sure, there's, I'm, I think that's, there's probably some truth in that. But what they're really not looking at is the science behind the short chain fatty acids that come from eating these foods. That's what's really interesting because it's really profound how these compounds attach to cells and actually produce signaling in the cell for our benefit. Just like the bad bacteria travel to cells and cause cell signaling and the detriment to our body. So some of the science shows that the gut bacteria, how it can manipulate the brain. We've even seen, let me just blow this up a minute. We've even seen how with some of these brain issues, we found that it can actually help with depression and anxiety. But the biggest thing that I wanna get through tonight is that it can actually manipulate our desire for food. In this context, at the very bottom, it, it says, this review tries to summarize the main data regarding the role of the gut microbiome in eating behavior and how gut dysbiosis, that's when the gut gets all filled up with the bad bacteria, can be responsible for maladaptive behavior such as food addiction. In other words, what these studies are showing is these bad bacteria, especially when they're outnumbered and they, they're, they're in excess, can travel up to the brainstem and can be responsible for food addiction. It can hit those pleasure centers in the hypothalamus and it can make us want to eat more and more of the very foods that we really don't want to eat because these foods are what create a lot of other problems. They create a dopamine drop. So when you're eating a lot of these foods and you can't stop and you hit those dopamine centers, then it takes more and more and more food to get the same effect. So then now you're in a full-blown addiction. But just like all of the others that I talk about with muscles and insulin, gut bacteria can be a trigger. It can be a trigger to get you on that runaway train to food addiction. Because it doesn't just happen on its own, right? Something triggers us to have the behavior to want to eat more. So I also want to talk about how some of these short-chain fatty acids are invo involved in anti-aging. Now, I know I've talked in some of the other podcasts. I'm going to review them. So those that already know this, just sit back and relax because we're going to have a little review on aging and how our chromosomes begin to unravel, they unravel at the ends. And part of aging is when these chromosomes become shortened, these little telomeres. These are the ends of our chromosomes. Our chromosomes is what carries all the DNA and tells our cells to either mutate and maybe not turn out so well, or keep us young and youthful. So when the DNA strands begin to shorten, they do it through enzymes. And these enzymes 
that go in and start to unravel these histones, because that's what's at the end of these, are these little histone bodies. This is what creates aging. So anti-aging is if we could stop this enzyme deacetylases, these enzymes, from unraveling the chromosomes. Because as we age, we start to get our telomeres shortened, which is why we get wrinkles, because the cells don't go back like they used to. And this shows remarkably, let me blow this up for you in a minute, this shows how short-chain fatty acids there is an abundance of evidence that shows short-chain fatty acids may play an important role in the maintenance of health and the development of disease. Short-chain fatty acids are a subset of fatty acids that are produced by the gut microbiota during the fermentation process. But the big thing that I want you to get here is how these short-chain fatty acids can inhibit this enzyme breakdown of these chromosomes. So it basically helps us with anti-aging. So this is really important because we already know people that eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, their skin looks better, they just look healthier. Well, there's now science that shows that these short-chain fatty acids, in fact, can be very instrumental in the aging process because they actually inhibit the enzymes that cause the aging process. And it only gets better. Short chain fatty acids also affect the lymphocytes. These are immune cells. So it's as if these immune cells have their own little receptor sites waiting for these short chain fatty acids to attach to them. These short chain fatty acids go to the bloodstream, they find these receptor sites, and when they dock on them on these cells, they actually cause positive things to happen in the cell. And this study gives light to that. A mounting body of evidence indicates a dietary fiber produced by the bacteria plays an essential role in balancing the immune system. Dietary fat, considered a non-essential nutrient in the past, it is now maybe considered to be more of an essential nutrient because it affects immunity and it suppresses inflammation and even possibly allergic responses. Yeah, let me tell you what, you get IBS and it seems like you have an allergic problem to everything or some kind of... Food sensitivity, that's all because of this microbiome. Short-chain fatty acids, acetate, propanate, and butyrate, these are the metabolites they're talking about. And if we go back to the highlight at the bottom, short-chain fatty acids act on many cells to regulate a number of important biological processes, including metabolism, intestinal functions, and the immune system. In this particular study, they talked about these short-chain fatty acids that affected the immune system, which can help in regulating cardiovascular disease because cardiovascular disease is an immune response. So this has shown to actually help reduce plaque in the arteries. So more about short-chain fatty acids and obesity, the impact of the gut bacteria on human health and disease in this study. And they talk about the balance. First of all, they talk about how a high fat diet can alter the composition of bacteria. And this is true because a high fat diet increases firmicutes, which are more of the bad bacteria and lowers the levels of the baccarotes, which are the good bacteria. And the studies have shown that obesity may be associated with this decreased diversity. In other words, somebody's not eating enough fruits and vegetables. Somebody's not getting that gut microbiome very fit. And they're getting a lot of these firmicutes, these, these bad bacteria that we have found is related to metabolic diseases. Well, 
There you go. Bad bacteria travel. And when you don't have enough of the good ones, I'll tell you what, you're not making an ample supply of short chain fatty acids to help you. Gut bacteria could also affect obesity by promoting chronic inflammation. That's because the immune cells are not going to be as able to protect you as if they had a lot of the short chain fatty acids helping them. And there's a lot of research on the microbiota and the brain gut access by both of these metabolites, not just the bacteria, but also the short chain fatty acids. In this study, they talk about the gut microbiota in the plaque, atherosclerosis. That's the plaque and the arteries. And they talk about a certain gut bacteria, which is trimethylamine and oxidase, which we call TMAO for short. And it's this bacteria that affects the endothelial dysfunction. Endothelial is the cells that line your arteries. It's the key event in the development of plaque and lesions that is part of cardiovascular disease. A growing set of evidence has indicated that the gut microbiota derived from TMAO and all its dietary precursors are involved in the dysfunction, in the breakdown of that artery wall and developing atherosclerosis, which is the plaque. And mice fed a colon-rich diet, which comes from a high-fat diet, high-sugar diet, usually from a lot of cheese, eggs, and meat, high-fat, that can cause this damage because it creates this bacteria. And this bacteria, they have identified in the arteries to be damaging. And here's a great study from Dr. Michael Greger on nutritionfacts.org. It's a great information site to go to. And he talks here how TMAO, TMAO short for trimethylamine oxide, was identified with the blood of patients who had experienced a heart attack or stroke. And it was compared to the blood of those who hadn't. The more TMAO bacteria people had in their blood, the more likely they would go on to suffer a heart attack, stroke, or otherwise die prematurely. Where does TMAO come from? Just exactly the same as short-chain fatty acids. They're both produced by bacteria. The short-chain fatty acids are produced by the good bacteria, and TMAO is coming from not so good bacteria. And this gut bacteria originates from foods rich in eggs, meat. It's usually bringing the choline and the carnitine and also a high fat diet can contribute to more bad gut bacteria because it protects them from being killed from the good. But bottom line, we can identify some of these bad bacteria in relation to diseases. And TMAO is a bacteria a lot of cardiologists are testing for because they know when the patient has a high level of TMAO that there's going to be some lesions in the artery because that's what this bacteria does. This is a great picture that shows that. That bacteria can go in there, weaken the artery, and with the plaque that's building up underneath that lesion, this is when you have more of a susceptibility to a stroke because that's when that plaque dislodges, can actually cause a clog, and that's what a heart attack is all about. So the role of TMAO in these lesion formation and development, the higher levels of TMO in circulation have a crucial role in the foam cell formation. Foam cells come from immune cells in the artery that have been oxidized. And this bacteria makes you more vulnerable. And it's made in the gut. Bacteria in the gut travel. But it's not just about immune cells. It's not about arteries. And yes, it travels up the brainstem, but it does other things 
in neurodegenerative diseases. The gut bacteria plays a role with Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, central nervous system disorders. So the neural pathways, as it's stated here, highlighted some gut microbes can produce neuroactive metabolites and neurotransmitters. So there are gut bacteria that help us produce good neurotransmitters, but they also can do bad bacteria. And these bad bacteria can travel through the blood-brain barrier and they activate other pathways. Ultimately, after you've eaten this food, these can actually travel through the brainstem and affect the brain. Let's go down to the second, hold on, let me see. Got a little technical difficulty, there we go. So it travels through the brainstem and this also talks about how it can affect the hypothalamic pathway, which is all about the appetite control. In the second segment of this, it also shows in the highlight, many studies have supported the crucial function of short-chain fatty acids in the brain. Studies have shown that the levels of short-chain fatty acids change in many neurological diseases, including Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, cerebrovascular diseases, stroke, epilepsy, neuroinflammatory diseases, MS, mood disorders, autism, depression, which all imply that short-chain fatty acids may be vital to the micro-gut brain access communication. So the studies here talk about how these two chemicals that are made in the gut travel to other parts of the body and why it is critical if you're trying to get to your leanest weight, live your healthiest life, gut bacteria is hugely implicated, not just from a food addiction standpoint, but from a balance standpoint, not just from an appetite perspective, but from a health perspective. And let me tell you what, as a society, are we eating enough vegetables? Heck no. Are we eating a variety of plants? Heck no. I see so many diets that they don't eat any grains. They don't eat beans because they're on some crazy diet. And guess what? Eventually, you don't eat grains and you don't eat beans. Eventually, you're not going to be able to eat grains or beans. You will actually build up a sensitivity. It's crazy how that works. But the body has to be built up to eat these foods. Sure, some people can have intolerances, never go away. I understand that. Some foods you just have to eliminate. But there's a lot of people walking around with gut issues that are only able to eat eight foods because they've done such a lousy job getting their gut to be fit. So how do we get a fit gut? A healthy gut comes from the right amount and variety and keeping the fat grams low. Now, listen, not really low. I'm not really saying, oh, you got to be on this super low fat diet. You need to keep your fat what it should be. So when we talk about the macronutrients, any registered dietitian is going to give you these percentages. And these percentages are going to be about the macronutrients and fat is going to be a third of your diet, 30%, 35% at the max, which for most people is going to be only 40 to 70 grams of fat a day. It's not a lot of fat when you consider one tablespoon of oil is 15 grams, one avocado is 22 grams. You can get up to 50 grams super fast. And if you go to one restaurant meal, you're easily over 50 to 60 grams, even when you're trying super hard to eat super healthy. But once that gut bacteria gets messed up, you will start to see it's going to get much harder to lose weight because it affects you internally. It actually changes your appetite as well. 
And you know it's true because when you've gone on this like health food kick and you're like, oh yeah, I'm just eating really healthy. You notice all of a sudden after a week or two, your gut changes. This it does. It changes really after one meal, but you'll notice that your preferences for food begin to change as well. That's no accident. That's chemical and it's happening in the gut. So how much do we need? And this looks like really a lot. People go, oh my God, I could never eat that much. As a rule of thumb, three cups of greens. I mean, I don't care if you're doing uh, a salad with two cups of greens and then maybe a cup of string beans or I don't know how you want to do it. Maybe you do all three cups of greens, one big salad, and then one and a half cups of you know, some other type of vegetable that's got some other different color than green. So you could have tomatoes, you could have carrots, you could have sweet potatoes, you could have something else other than green. And then a half a cup minimum of some type of bean or lentil. And then a little bit of that omega-3, one to two teaspoons. This is how you make the gut. Also bringing some grains in as well. This is the standard most people aren't getting because I'm going to tell you what. Most people have no problem bringing in the carbs from the grains. That's going to be the breads and the pastas. But your body wants you to have a variety and to have an amount. That's the key for a healthy gut. And the root cause of obesity is not knowing how to eat to properly balance, not knowing how to eat to keep the muscles, insulin, gut bacteria, and hopefully out of the brain chemical addiction to where there's no feedback loops, where it becomes a, a, a way of life. It's a lifestyle. You start understanding how to eat these little bits of information, just get into your brain and you remember them and it's by default. And it's developing the lifestyle that does it. So I think a lot of times it's maybe tough to get a lot of the fruits and vegetables in during the day because you're at work, you got a job, you can't sit down. Okay, maybe at night it means a big salad. Maybe at night it's, you know, three cups of greens. We're throwing a couple tomatoes in there, uh, a little half a cup of beans in there. Maybe that's just part of your regimen. Or we're looking at an Instapot. I want to talk more about some recipes on some of the other nights and we're putting in our Instapot as many vegetables as we can and we're having a bowl of that. But it comes down to having what I consider medicinal bowls every single day. And if you haven't met Karen, our food coach, you're missing out because you need to. You need to get on a Zoom with her and see what she has up her sleeve because she does magic with food. And what Karen's putting together for the first of the year is entire medicinal bowls. We're working together on putting some of those together so that in January, we're going to have some recipes for you guys to just plug and go. But gut health is a huge part of all this. It's not just about cleaning your colon. It's about understanding all the other things that these fibers do in our gut, healthy things. And when you're looking at a food label, it's all about understanding what this food label means with those four areas. Look at the total fat. I mean, if you need 50 grams of fat a day and this has eight, well, that's not so bad, right? I mean, that, that can work. But then how does it look from a standpoint of carbs? How do the carbs look in relationship to the fiber and protein? So understanding how to eat, which is what this course is all about, empowers you to maintain balance, to be able to keep these four areas from doing any type of negative feedback for you so that you can live your leanest and healthiest life. When we look at other foods, by the way, oh my gosh, a lot of people look at cheese. Everybody thinks that cheese is a protein food. Cheese is a fat food. 75% of the calories from cheese come from fat. So this could be a real gut killer, right? So if you did a lot of cheese and maybe eggs and then some nuts and avocados, everybody says, well, you're pretty healthy. But that right there could be a gut killer, not realizing it. 
So with fiber, it does three big things. Cleans the colon, makes good bacteria, and makes short chain fatty acids. So I hope this was helpful. I'm going to, if you want to unmute your mic, anybody wants to ask questions, love it, love it. Or you can leave comments. You can tell me if this was helpful, not helpful. I have a question. Sure. So you mentioned before how the gut, you know, some people, it's harder for them to eat healthy because they don't necessarily have the bacteria to break down, you know, because they didn't get this variety of certain plant foods, they just can't process things. So it's going to be a bit harder for them to kind of get into this healthy habit than someone who, you know, is already kind of used to that lifestyle. So that being said, when you presented your chart on that vegetables, I mean, how realistic is it for someone to eat that chart if they've, I mean, if you were to take a relatively healthy person, it'd probably be easier to do what you recommended. But if someone maybe was overweight, they did, the, you know, they, they're not used to eating healthy. How long do you think it would take for them to acclimate to that chart you showed? Good question. I've worked with patients and sometimes it can take six months. Sometimes it can take over a year, but they build slowly. They start adding it slowly. So you wouldn't necessarily eat that full rec. You couldn't eat that off the bat if your gut was so messed up. So if someone's overweight, what, how would you alter that chart? If you're saying it takes six months to get there, not really. or maybe even a year, do I want to titrate that a little bit slower until I can handle those foods? Or do you just go, you just do it? So I've had um, people that have been obese and they do it and no problem. So it's not really obesity necessarily. I think it's the person as an individual. I, I would say you have to experiment. You know, maybe you start out with with half and see how it goes. If you find a lot of burping and you just can't tolerate it, then you would cut it down a little more. So I would say for most people, they ought to be able to do maybe one and a half cups of vegetables a day. Mm -hmm. Maybe they only can do one fourth cup of beans. And all beans are different, so not all beans will cause issues. So, you know, maybe maybe you start here. I know some people will do uh, uh, some type of these cleanses, and I can't believe how they just start right in some of these diets, and they go, oh, yeah, well, I was sick for, for four days, and I just, just pushed through it, and then I was fine. So with the gut, because you have all these fibers and your body's trying to, you know, break them down, I would say most people can probably do half of this and be okay. But somebody who's had really bad gut issues, maybe not. And there's going to be certain types of foods people can tolerate. So let's say you can't do any type of carrots or sweet potatoes, but you can do squashes, you can do tomatoes, you can't do cabbage. I would say what I would try to do is build up on the foods you know you can eat and then slowly do small little bits of the foods that you like to build up to eating. So maybe carrots are a problem. Okay, so maybe what we do is we do just one or two carrot sticks for that day. You know, it's like, I just do a little bit. Because if you a lot of people, when they see this, they go, oh, I'm just gonna double up and go all down on it. And then they have really a lot of bloating and burping. It's like, okay, you need to bring that sucker back and slowly build it up. I don't know if there is, there really is no set in stone, you know, if you're overweight, you can't do this or you can't do that. I, I, it's not really, I have found been the case. Well, not only, well, not that you're overweight, but that what you're talking about, all this bloating, like I would think that, you know, someone who's trying to get healthy would, would have these side effects and that would maybe turn them off to keep going. And I know sometimes part of dieting may be part of like, oh, the willpower, but you know, some people don't really want discomfort. So I would think if you're bloating and you're burping and some people get gas when they eat too, you know, the beans can affect people that if you're not used to it that way, that 
I can see people being turned off to those healthy foods, kind of like, you you know, and that's going to revert them to go back. They're going to intuitively think, oh, if I'm feeling sick eating this, then, and the meat wasn't doing, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it would be, I just think if someone's trying to get into the system that you're saying, it's like, it doesn't matter if you're obese or not, but you know, if we want to minimize the side effects so that they don't have this like idea that this is not working, I guess, I guess that's where I'm, why would, I was curious how you would ease into it. That's a really good point. I think that takes some experimenting. I would say probably at least 80% of the population could probably do half of this. But you're right. Let's say somebody doesn't eat any vegetables at all and they've been eating junk for a really long period of time and their gut's really a mess, then maybe maybe a cup maybe all they can tolerate and maybe they have to do it half a cup at lunch and half a cup at dinner but after they start doing it their body will as they slowly bring it in their body will start to be able to tolerate it more okay that's a really good question though i think a lot of times what people do is they say oh well i have issues so they give up and they're like, well, I can never eat that because one day I ate a cup of right, meat. Because they, they don't feel well on it. So they make right. this like I know some people talk about like the keto flu that when they came off of keto, they get really sick. So that was an indication that they oh I should have stayed on it. Like, see, because when I'm not on it, I'm sick. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. So they, they intuitively think it's one thing happening is something else when that's not actually what's going on. Exactly. That's a really good point. Yeah. I have a question. Um, so this is in total about four and a half cups for us to strive for. Is this um, four and a half cups of raw vegetables or is it cooked? Because maybe kind of like uh, how we were talking about the medicinal bowls could be the hack where if we're consuming um maybe two cups of cooked vegetables that could be equivalent to four cups of vegetables. Um, So does it matter like cooked versus not cooked in terms of volume? So cooked vegetables will be much easier for people to be able to digest them. When you get raw vegetables, although, you know, there's a lot to be said about the raw because you get some of the different um, enzymes a little differently, but for the short chain fatty acids, they can come from cooked, you know, as well as, as raw and the bacteria as well. Okay. So there's a little more benefit in some of the eating raw, but it can be much, much harder on people trying to digest the raw than the cooked. Um, okay. Leafy greens. Yes. Obviously you got to have those raw, right? So, and there's some things in leafy greens, it's just really hard to get in some of the other vegetables. There's things with the green color vegetables that you're not necessarily going to get with the other colors. So green's got a lot of little special properties. They're high in vitamin K, which is wonderful for reversing plaque. Um, These green vegetables have typically higher calcium. They have higher values in other nutrients that you won't see in the others but that's a really good question and i'm going to say you know if you did um easily you know two cups of spinach raw is probably three-fourths cup cooked so yeah you could actually go with with saying that the three-fourths cup cook is like the, the two cups raw so the key is that with this gut chart When you're looking at the amount, what you're looking at is definitely, you know, four cups, like you said, of vegetables a day. A lot of people go, oh my God, that's so much. But when you cook them, that does condense them down. And I think one of the things you and I saw, Karen, is when we put together the medicinal bowls that we're putting together for everybody and how cooking down like especially some of the squashes and 
you can get five cups of vegetables cooked down into two cups, which counts as five cups of vegetables. Because when you put it in that pressure cooker, it really shrinks it all down. So the key with, I think, the gut for a lot of people starting out, it's much easier to do the cooked. And also certain vegetables have certain compounds raw that may even be better cooked. Like spinach has oxalates in them. And some of these chemicals are actually better to be, um, oxalates are chemicals that are in some of these leafy greens so that bugs won't eat the greens. But excessive amount of oxalates could, for some people, cause kidney stones. But when you cook them, you kill all the oxalates. So, I mean, there's there's probably some benefit in that. But for our purposes and for the gut, I think if it's easier for people to cook them, which for most people it is, it's probably the better way to go. They can get more in when it's cooked than they can raw. And it's easier to digest cooked vegetables than it will be the raw ones. Does that help, Karen? Any other questions? When you have someone whose gut is really shredded, let's say from like an aspartame that they were on, not aspartame, I'm sorry, aspirin that they've been on for years to correct the migraine that was probably started by the gut imbalance to begin with. And they're living off of those dopamine hits of fat and sugar, which are also going to cause that bad bacterial overgrowth. Do you keep them eating what they've been eating, like the creamer and the coffee? Um, and they're kind of living off of that because everything they eat, they're like, it hurts. Do yeah. you still start with just incorporating fiber or do you also work on reducing the fat and controlling the sugar even when they're eating probably very little because they're terrified to eat and they're just living off those dopamine hits yeah they're terrified to eat um they get terrible ibs and here's the problem with that mckenna is that they probably have candida uh yeast overgrowth they probably have SIBO small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. So their gut is so filled with so much dysbiosis mm -hmm. that in some cases you have to try to kill the bacteria before you can fix them. Cause it's just, it's just, there's so, so many. I know with yeast, when people have candida, um, a lot of times you got to get an antifungal from a doctor. You actually have to go in there and start killing this. Um, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, antibiotics actually can kill a lot of that. And then you're kind of starting over. You got a little bit of a clean slate starting over, but a lot of antibiotics can also create a situation where you develop more bad bacteria because the antibiotics go in there and they kill everything, the good and the bad. So then you start going back to your diet and it's like, oh my God, any good guys you had are gone. And now the bad guys start to really flourish. But, you know, answer to your question, um, when I'm working with patients that have IBS, I really try to just maybe think about, um, and we can talk um, next Wednesday, I'll bring some supplements for you guys um, that can actually help that. Some some grapefruit extracts, some cer cer certain supplements that studies have shown can help kill some of the bad bacteria, oregano oil. But if it's really bad, McKenna, okay, sometimes you might need medical intervention, right, to get in there. And because if, if look, I've had patients that have been so bad, and I'm not, listen, I'm not at all for drugs, but I'm just not getting any resolve. They're just, they've got candida so bad, they've got the SIBO so bad. Mm -hmm. uh, urinary tract infections, a lot of urinary tract infections are coming because of poor gut dysbiosis, candida. I think that, and, and we can even do, um, I can show you some, I can do some great podcasts on candida mm -hmm. and what some of these, you know, a lot of people don't realize a lot of their symptoms can be because of these fungals and these bacteria that have traveled to other parts of the body and causing the headaches the migraines, the rashes, you know, it's actually the bacteria in the gut that's 
um, they're not even associating necessarily to being a gut issue. And they're having all these other symptoms in other places. Mm -hmm. But it is, whenever I get a patient with IBS, I'm like, oh God, it's like the hardest patient because no IBS patient's the same. They could be fine with one food and then the next week it's another food. Half of them are scared to death to eat because it's like they don't even, they can't find a pattern. They don't really know what to eat. And the gut dysbiosis can change daily, right? Mm -hmm. So it can be worse one day and not as bad the next. And all of a sudden they can tolerate this, but then they couldn't tolerate that. But here's the deal. You got to get on a plan with these people. Mm -hmm. And you got to start, you know, building and it's consistency and it's checking in. And if you guys want me to, you know, send me an email. If you want next, next Wednesday, I'll, I'll bring um, info on some supplements that they can, they can possibly help with gut dysbiosis. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested in that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Definitely. We'll do that. Okay. Thank you, Myrna. I mean, I think the gut is. When I, when I think about how many people have gut issues, I think what I saw from the CDC, over 50% of, the, of Americans have gut issues. That's like, what? And then when you look at depression, anxiety, that's almost 100% related to gut. If somebody has anxiety or depression, they've got a gut issues, period. Okay. So that's related as well. So what I and then and I just told you tonight all these other you know diseases that are related to the gut because of the the receptor sites that are waiting for these short chain fatty acids to appear and and help with prevention of inflammation and you're just not eating anything to make that happen and then instead all these bad bacteria are arriving at the scene and are causing arthrosclerosis and things that people may not, your doctor may not associate with the gut. And a lot of times when patients go to the doctor and they have like, well, the doctor couldn't, it's idiopathic. He couldn't figure out what was wrong, especially when it comes to gastro issues or GERD, some type of GERD. I'm telling you, the reason why they can't find anything wrong with them is because it's gut related. When it's bacteria gut related, unless they're doing a specific test, to measure for the gut bacteria, which most of them don't do, then they just say, hey, we don't know what's wrong with you. A lot of times people get frustrated because they're like, you know, my doctor, they think I'm crazy. They're giving me an antidepressant. I'm giving them all these symptoms. And they're like, we checked you. There's nothing wrong with you. Well, there's probably nothing structurally wrong with them, but it's a big, typically gut problem. This, this at the stem of all this. And for obesity, if you don't get this right, it's not going to work out because you're still going to have issues with food. It's a big part of the root cause of obesity. A lot of diets address the insulin. I mean, insulin is a big one. Oh yeah, I just do the low carb diet. And it's like, they focus on one thing and they don't address the other things. I, I just had a new patient tell me, yeah, I started fasting. I'm like, well, why are you fasting? Nobody fasts because they love to fast, okay? People are fasting because they truly believe it's going to benefit them health-wise. And it's a disaster. It creates more gut dysbiosis, creates muscles to rebel. Insulin gets all whacked out when you finally do eat, right? So the gut bacteria to me is the one part of nutrition I think that's People just don't understand the importance of eating these foods. They really don't. They just think of vitamins and the minerals inside these vegetables or that it's going to help them poop, right? But they don't realize all these other chemicals that are involved and how cells are, are, are literally waiting for all the things that are going to come from eating these foods. So... To me, it's the new frontier in medicine because I think more and more we're finding, we're associating autoimmune disorders, um, certain diseases with gut bacteria. We are actually able to identify gut bacteria to certain diseases, which to me is really mind-blowing to, to some degree. 
Hey, Marna. Yeah. It's Natalie. I have a question. Um, um, I mean, I, I kind of know your take on probiotics, but don't they help with that? Like yeah. if you're like you're new into, you know, which I'm not, but if you're you're new to doing balance and you do have gut issues, which most people are going to when they start eating that way, um, um, will, will the probiotics help with that part of it or no? Yeah, definitely. There's like over a thousand species of good bacteria. I think about that, a thousand species. Yeah. That, that's a lot. And what about, what's your take on digestive enzymes? I know, I know they have to be like plant-based, but because I mean, I had a problem at one time and um, exactly what you said before I did this, like 20 years ago, and I had a stomach problem and I went to the doctor, they couldn't find anything wrong with me. Um, and then um, I started taking like some um, digestive enzymes just for a short time and it all went away. Yes. I, I mean, I don't know if I got lucky um, or I just caught it in time, but um, it really helped. Yeah. So you're going to get issues when you can't digest the food. Okay. So digestive enzymes, depending on which one he gives you, you can get digestive enzymes that are to break down fat, sugar, protein. And then the other digestive enzymes are bacterial enzymes like Beano. You know, you can get the enzyme Beano. Like if you have a problem eating beans, you take Beano. Beano is just the enzyme, the plant-based enzyme to break down beans so yes the more oh wow oh that yeah That's... yep and so there's other there's other enzymes from bacteria that i'll come next wednesday with that help break down some of these fibers okay well but um go ahead but they but with the probiotics you're maybe getting 15 strains that make it through the stomach because the problem is that all these bacteria need to be made in an alkaline environment. So when you take a probiotic, it's got to go through the stomach first. And that is going to create a problem because the acid in the stomach is so strong, right? That it's yeah. going to kill a lot of the bacteria. So how do you know? So how do you know you'll tell us which one then or which so, ones are better? Or how yeah, do we know? So, yeah, so most of the ones they buy on the market are the hardier ones. But you got to be taking at least 20 billion. I try to get my patients on at least. But there's so many of them out there now. Yep. And we'll talk about that, the lactobacillus one. We'll talk about which ones are the better ones. But yeah, I, th I think that would be a very interesting topic. Okay. Yep. I'll bring that to the table. But the stomach acid kills all the species that are made in the gut because this is alkaline once the food passes this little spinker here it then gets a wash and it becomes all alkaline so all these are made in an alkaline environment they would die in an acidic environment the ones you buy commercially are able to make it through this one of the few but that's absolutely a good point. Better to have some than none at all. And some of the hardier ones can actually help with fighting off the bad ones. That's why when a lot of people take probiotics, they actually feel better. They feel a little more relief. It yeah, they really helped me. But when I was transitioning, I, I don't take them regularly now, but because that was a long time ago. But I also wanted to tell say tell everybody you know especially the people that are new are doing this um it did go away it goes away eventually at least it did for me i guess unless you know your body gets used to eating that eventually you just have to like train it how you have to untrain it to eat the things you thought you were eating that were healthy that were not healthy and now train it to eat the things now that myrna is teaching you that are healthy and it did all go away, all my stomach issues. But it didn't go away overnight. It took some No, time. no, it was not overnight. It and, took a while. And it's funny because if you go back, I guarantee, Natalie, if you were to go eat a junky meal, like you go to a restaurant and you're just eating a ton of fat and there's no fiber, you probably get a terrible stomach ache. Oh, terrible. Yeah, terrible. 
Like I'm doubled over. Like I'm like, and now I know it though. So I don't do it. Right. Because you don't let, you don't have the bacteria to break down all that fat and stuff that you know. So it works opposite as well. Yes. So the, you will develop the bacteria that you need for the foods you're eating and the foods that you're eating will then communicate to your brain to keep eating them. So as this bacteria flourishes from the food you're eating, it then tells the brain, hey, keep feeding us that because we want to stay alive. So the goal is to not let the bad guys be the guys in charge. So, so let me ask you, that's an interesting factor because, um, you know, um, you know, people make fun of me because what I eat, but, you know, and I love it. So when I say that, but I thought it was because of my palate, it just changes. But do you think it's both? Do you think it has something to do with the gut? It's more well, the your gut. Palate, your palate's in the brain. Your palate is the hypothalamus. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. So this is what this study talked about. That it actually changes the microbiota can travel to the brain. Let me see if it's this study here. Gosh, yeah. that's that's yeah. so interesting. Microbial control over eating behavior, including the microbial influence on the reward and satiety pathways. Those are the dopamine centers that um, McKenna was talking about. It produces toxins that alter mood, change receptors, including taste receptors. It hijacking it of the vagus nerve. That's the one that goes from the gut up to the brain and the neural axis between the gut and brain. We also review the evidence for alternative explanations for cravings and unhealthy eating behavior because microbiota are easily manipulated by prebiotics. Prebiotics meaning fibers. Probiotics, antibiotics, fecal transplants, and dietary changes alter our microbiota and it offers a, an approach to an otherwise unapproachable problem with obesity and unhealthy eating. So basically, when you say your palate changed, that's what changed. Your palate's up in the brain. It's not on your tongue. And so you developed a taste for those foods, but you didn't really develop the taste for the food. The gut did it for you through these microbes. Pretty wow. interesting. That's fascinating. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So all of this goes back to understanding the root cause of obesity, right? Is when people understand that it is a balance. There's really none that's more important than the other. Of course, when I talk about insulin resistance, everybody's like, oh yeah, well, you know, everybody's all down on the insulin thing. But what I talk about tonight, I mean, my God, gut bacteria, it's huge. It's huge. And I think all of these are huge. I mean, if you're in, in the brain stem and you're eating the hedonic way of eating, well, my God, that could throw you off right there. So when you figure these four things out, honest to God, your life changes. So the root cause of obesity is understanding this, not necessarily trying to diet and fast and you don't even know what you're doing and it's hit or miss and let's try to cut our calories. None of that matters. This is the only thing that matters if you're really, truly wanting to make a lasting change. Gut bacteria to me is, I think a lot of my patients, one of the reasons why they have obesity issues, because they seem to be able to do the insulin okay, and you know, they get the carbs right, you know, their, their daily values of the fats, they don't have this one down at all. And they'll tell me, that's, that's a lot of work, Myrna. How am I going to do that? So that's why... Thank God for Karen, because she's going to really help us pull some recipes together so we can tell people, just eat this. And when we say just eat that, we want to give you medicinal bowls. I call them medicinal bowls because when you're looking at the gut, what else can we call them, right? I mean, they're going to change your microbiome. They're going to change your behavior about food. 
figuring out how to get these vegetables in your gut. And if you know somebody, McKenna, like you were talking about that has all this gut dysbiosis, we got to figure out how to clean that mess up first. But keep in mind, Natalie, because you had it before doesn't mean you're free from it. You just go back to eating that way. It's going to come right back, right back. And also interesting, the relationship between obesity itself, the fact you have a lot of fat cells can actually alone change the microbiota. That's interesting research as well that, that they did on mice. They took fat mice, lean mice. They translocated the microbiome from the fat mouse to the lean mouse. The lean mouse got fat. The fat mouse got lean, all based on changing the gut microbiome. They believe it's because it affects your appetite. It affects your palate. That's why when you eat vegetables, sometimes you'll feel like you're not hungry. It also has a uh, glucose and insulin resistant. Uh, they, feel, they find that it's, they, they believe it has a uh, glucose metabolism benefits that these short chain fatty acids on their own can produce ATP without even needing calories. It's kind of weird. I won't go into all that science tonight, but I want you guys to know the big picture is that these, this is not just about eat your vegetables, get your vitamins and minerals. This is about if you want to solve the obesity issue for good, this may be the last frontier for some of you guys. You got to figure this one out. You got to figure it out. You got to figure out how you're going to do it. Once you get it done, you're done. Then you live that life. Like Natalie, you don't even think about it. You just live this life. And, you know, if I can share your story, you were, what, 60 pounds overweight, right? 65. And then you haven't seen that in years. You don't go yo-yo back. But all you did at one time was yo-yo. Now that's like... Nobody even believes you were overweight. You're such a little thing. You weigh like 105 on a wet day. People look at you and they can't even believe you ever were overweight. Am I right? You're right. They don't believe me. I have to show them a picture. I'll, I'll try to find one for the class for next week so they could see it. Yeah. It's bad. But it, I didn't know. You don't know, you know. One thing I have to say with what Myrna does is, you know, to everybody, you don't know what you don't know. I, I was one of the people who thought I ate healthy. I really did because I didn't need a lot of candy. I didn't need a lot of junk, but mm -hmm. I wasn't really eating healthy. So, you know, Myrna taught me how to how to do it. So you have to. It, it does work. It does work. But, yeah, I haven't yo-yoed in like 20 years. Yeah, it's been that long. Yeah, long time. And and I've stayed the same weight, like even when I've had like an injury and I couldn't exercise or things happen to me in my life, which things happen to people, you I still my weight has not fluctuated, which is almost amazing. I get very nervous about it because I think it will. Right. Um, which tells you it's just more about the food. Right. You know, the exercise is important, but it's really more about the food because right. You can't exercise, but then eat whatever you want. It doesn't work that way. Right. I mean, you might, when you're younger, you might be able to, but probably not at my age. So, um, yeah, I mean, I appreciate uh, you teaching everybody and, this. And your lab values, Natalie, your lab values are, you blow people away. Yeah, they're bad. They're good. They're, I am working on, you know, I'm, I'm always working to be better. I think, you know, 20 years ago, I was feeding a family. And that's why I wanted to tell, uh, you know, I used to hide some of the vegetable. I used to try to hide vegetables in the meals because I was still cooking for my family at that time so that my kids didn't, you know, like I would, I would put like things I did was like, if I made back then, I eat very differently now than I used to eat 20 years ago, but um, I used to like hot, get a, you know, a can of, you know, pumpkin and hot, you know, put it in chili just to add, you know, just to add extra, just to have extra stuff in there. Um, right. 
you know, you know, I, I put, uh, you know, frozen squash, I would get frozen squash and microwave it and then put it in something that I was, you know, feeding everybody just to, just to get the vegetables to make sure I was getting them a long time ago that I don't do that now, but I did used to do that just to get those extra vegetables in. But my stomach was a mess when I started this, it was really bad. Mm -hmm. um, so I was, I was on several medications and that not, they weren't even helping. So I just stopped taking, I said, I'm done with this. I'm not taking these. So, um, I just stopped taking them. And that's when I took the, you know, started with the probiotics and, the you know, digestive enzymes. And, and it was probably a combination of, because I was only a couple months into doing the, you know, fiber protein thing. So it was probably a combination, but I have to say on until that day, I never probably ate a bean. And now that's all I eat. But I, cause we, I didn't grow up eating a lot of beans. So I didn't really know baked beans, but you know, now, you know, I didn't never ate lentils before. I never had eaten um, lots of things. So, and now that's all I eat. So that it, 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 it does make a difference, but it does take time. You have to let your body adjust. But thank you, Myrna. Yeah, it does take some time. Okay, anybody else have any other comments? All right, well, I will get back with you guys next Wednesday. I'll bring some supplement ideas for gut dysbiosis, McKenna. Um, if it's real bad, we'll just, we'll talk about maybe, you know, medical interventions that you'd have to get with a doctor with, but we'll talk about that as well. And next Tuesday, I stay on track with The Lean Life. So email if you have any comments. And if nobody has anything else, I will see you guys next week. Bye-bye.